Uh, good morning, everybody, and can I welcome you to the 24th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014. Um, apologies have been received from Claire Adamson this morning, uh, and Joan McAlpine is due to replace her as a substitute, and hopefully she'll be here soon. Can I remind all those present that electronic devices should be switched off because they do interfere with the broadcasting system? Um, today we will hear from Tam Bailey, Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People. Uh, and can I welcome you, Tam, to the meeting? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. And, uh, we last heard from Tam in the context of scrutinising the Children and Young People Bill last year, when our discussion focused on children's rights and, of course, your new powers uh, that were contained within the bill. Uh, today, we'd like to follow up on that discussion by hearing about the work of your office more gen generally, and, of course, uh, your annual report for 2013-14, which all members have received. Um, before we start on the questioning, can I just invite Tam to make any opening remarks he wishes to start with? Yeah, um, I want to thank you for the, uh, the opportunity of speaking to you today. Uh, I have to say I really welcome it, uh, because one of my ambitions uh, is for children's rights to be owned right across Scottish society, uh, and the role of this committee uh, I see is very important, uh, not least of which she passed legislation, but it's got a much wider brief uh, in terms of uh, children's well-being, in terms of the realisation of, of children's rights. Uh, so I, I'm optimistic. I'll say at the beginning, in terms of where we're going with children's rights in Scotland, uh, I'll comment on the, the bill, which you, well, you know very well. Uh, um, I'll also give a view about where I think we're at with education uh, and children's rights, and I'll have the opportunity, hopefully, of filling in some of the proactive work that I'm involved in, in terms of domestic abuse, uh, particularly in terms of closing the attainment gap, because I know the committee's got a, 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 an inquiry coming up on this uh, later in the year. I, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, respect campaign uh, uh, in relation to school toilets and some of the developments there, uh, and of course another bit of work is uh, disability. Um, and I'll give you, if I get the chance, some overarching issues that I think uh, uh, either promote the well-being and the rights of children and young people, or hold us back uh, uh, as a society. So that's really, I mean, there's quite a lot to try and cover. Mm. Um, well, so. I know that uh, we have a, a number of members who have got questions in those, covering some of those areas at least, so I'm sure we'll get through quite a lot <coughs> um, in the question. Thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm going to start by asking George Adam to begin the question. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Tam. Morning. Uh, your annual report describes quite a lot of detail about what your actual uh, role is, uh, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and the work you do with the, within various communities in Scotland. But can you give me three specific uh, improvements you've made to children and young people's uh, lives in Scotland? Yeah, OK. I could give you more than three. Well, three is a uh, good start. <laughs> um, I want to talk about culture change. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, our approach to children and young people. So I spent a lot of time uh, engaging uh, with education uh, and I sense something changing quite significantly in terms of children's rights and the curriculum within education. And one of the examples I would give on that is that we currently have uh, more than half of our local authority schools, uh, with 40% or more of them signed up to a programme called Rights Respect in Schools in Scotland. We've also got uh, Education Scotland, uh, who've got uh, CPD training for teachers. Uh, they've engaged through particular training programmes with 23 of those local authorities and more to come. Uh, and they've got online training as well. So I think there's something really significant that's under the radar right now in terms of our approach to children and children's rights uh, within the curriculum. Uh, I, just allied to that, uh, we've published a, um, a document called Golden Rules, uh, which is about participation. We put a very heavy emphasis on it. We actually, our first run was about 3,000. We've now distributed 11,000 of these. And I think that's an indication of, and that, that's, without, that's on demand, uh, that's an indication of uh, professionals uh, preparedness to engage with children and young people on the basis of listening to their views. Um, if you want some specifics, we published a report uh, actually the, just after the publication of the annual report, which was called Learning Lessons, and we had employed peer researchers to um, canvas the views of about 800 youngsters about what was the impact of poverty in their education and what should be done about it. Uh, and in the publication of the report, 
the government uh, allocated 1.5 million specifically to follow up on the recommendations about how individual schools could alleviate uh, some of the impact of those children uh, who are living in poverty. Uh, and most recently, uh, there's been a lot of disquiet with regards to stop and search, police stop and search in Scotland. I've been quite outspoken uh, on that. Uh, the police have actually uh, changed their, uh, their, their practice in regard to stop and search for under-12s, but there's a long way to go here, because um, we're still sitting in uh, very high levels uh, of um, stop and search. And the last one I'll offer up just now is that I've, I've, been, I've long uh, spoken out about the need for additional health visitors to make the early years, or our ambitions in early years, uh, a reality. And thankfully, the government um, have actually announced uh, additional health visitors, 500 additional health visitors, uh, to make sure that some of that core uh, service provision is actually there. Um, so, now, the problem is, uh, um, I do lots and lots of work in partnership. And the more you do in partnership, the more you do alongside other agencies, uh, the more difficult, the more challenging it is to have direct attribution uh, for the efforts of my own office or myself. Uh, because really, I go back to what I said, I want everybody to own children's rights in Scotland. I want everybody to recognise that they've got a responsibility. And it's through that that I think we'll actually um, have better, more better adjusted uh, children growing into being uh, mature adults. A lot of what you've answered there, Tam, is basically what's in the report, was your engagement, your constant engagement with young people. I know I take on board the stop and search and the additional health visitors as actual making a difference in young people's day-to-day -day yeah. lives. Uh, but uh, a lot of the other stuff, uh, just uh, the engagement you've made with young people here. In the, how, what, how do you gauge your success in making that into a plan of action to actually to influence government policy or anything else? OK. If you want me to talk about government, um, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time uh, developing a right blether uh, for that to be the largest consultation ever. Uh, I've been pressing the government since then uh, to be much more ambitious about their consultations with children and young people. And just recently, there's some evidence of that where we assisted them. I don't want it to come through me, but we assisted them uh, in terms of uh, consultation and their sports strategy. And we very modestly said, we'll, we, I, we can assure, uh, using our contacts, that you'll get 300 responses. We had to stop at 1,700. Uh, and we did the analysis on that. And I think that's a model for our, an example of the, how easy it would be for the government to think big in terms of listening to children and young people, to think big about their engagement uh, with consultations and listening to their views. I, I go back, I sense a change right now. Ten years ago, uh, you would have to have argued to take on board the views of children and young people. That doesn't happen nowadays. Uh, the question is, how do we make that happen in as meaningful and as widespread a way as possible? People accept that you should be engaging and listening to the views of children and young people because they've got a particular perspective uh, that's unique to them. Uh, ten years ago, you would have to argue that really hard uh, to spend resources on it. Not now. The issue is how do we make sure that we do that in as effective a way as possible. Tam, would you say that we probably saw an example of that engagement with young people with the 16, 17-year-olds with their engagement in the political process during the referendum? Because I personally saw the difference in the tone of the campaign and uh, the enthusiasm coming from young people and the, the fact that they could participate in the political process. The answer is yes. I can't claim credit for 16, 17-year-olds oh. getting the vote, uh, although I did support it from the outset and supported it very strongly. And everything that happened in the referendum uh, confirmed uh, the maturity uh, with which those 16, 17-year-olds brought to the actual uh, election process. And I, I would say here now that I would hope that 16, 17-year-olds in French uh, uh, voting uh, extends to all elections. I know there are issues in that, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, the genie's out of the bottle uh, mm -hmm. and youngsters positively engaged in that. And well done. Well done in them and well done in us as a society for putting our faith in the capacity of 16, 17-year-olds to engage in democratic processes. And we are laying the seeds for uh, enhanced engagement of that age group. The research tells you elsewhere, the younger you vote, the more likely you are to continue okay. to vote. Thank you. <clears throat> Tam, you, you quite rightly, I think, pointed to the problem of how to directly connect yeah. the work and the outcomes. But 
I have to ask you, I mean, effectively, can you give us specific examples of outcomes, because we're all trying to be very outcome focused, um, of the work that your office does and an actual outcome which came from that work? You know, I, I'm, what I'm thinking about is, is there other examples of where effectively, um, you know, bullying has been reduced, uh, the idea that, uh, or, the, or the, the amount of violence on young people on other young people has been reduced, the, uh, you know, whether there has been um, an increase in rights and information and knowledge amongst young people about sexual exploitation, I mean, a whole range of issues. I mean, is there any specific figures that you can point to which give us a, an example of outcomes which have actually improved the lives of young people? Uh, well, I've already given you numerous examples of activities that are taking place in schools right now. Uh, and just to back up that business, uh, there's a piece of research that we're looking at just now uh, where we know that uh, we know that there are some schools, some youngsters who, despite living in trauma, uh, do remarkably well. And there are some schools, despite serving poor areas, do remarkably well. We've got a piece of research right now uh, which is identifying schools that are high-performing against what you would expect in terms of the socioeconomic area. Uh, and we know some of that's about CPD, some, uh, some of it for continuous improvement, some of it's about quality of teaching, uh, uh, some of it's about the leadership in the school. Some of it looks as if it's about participation in schools. And I think that we will be able to demonstrate, I, I don't want to spike the results of it, but all of this activity that I'm talking about in terms of increased participation in schools actually improves outcomes of children in those schools. So that massive change and that really sea change that I'm talking about just now, I believe we'll be able to demonstrate that that will result in uh, better attainment for children in schools. Uh, there's lots of, uh, I mean, you know that I've got an inquiry service, so there's lots of individuals who will come, uh, who will seek assistance either in terms of advice, information, or indeed me uh, um, engaging uh, with public bodies. So, I mean, I could give you examples of young people who maybe have been excluded from a sports club because of a, a minor uh, uh, argument and the parents and the parents are contacting us to know what the rights are in terms of uh, making a complaint on that. Uh, I gave evidence to the SPCB of youngsters where the boundary change was going to have a really detrimental impact on their care packages and I get involved with that and the, the they, they shifted uh, the actual boundary as a result of that representation. There's lots and lots of examples uh, where, on an individual basis, then we get involved. But actually, I'm looking for systemic change uh, through the office. So that will still that will still be there. And of course, I can let you know uh, about the plans for extended powers of the commissioner's office, and we're gearing up for that right now. Okay, thank you, Mary. Question was very good, and I listened carefully for uh, for an answer. And I think we're still waiting for it. And I convenient if I may say, I thought you'd follow up. It was very good. Uh, your response to George was cultural change. You're engaging with education, and Education Scotland is doing training. You're working in partnership, and you're pressing government. Now, I still haven't heard a definite outcome. And really, what I want to ask is. Education Scotland could well have improved their training anyway. That's part and parcel of what they're about. But the main thing, uh, convener, was um, Mr Bailey said wants everybody to own children's rights. And when I read through this, it seemed to be more about Tam's plan. Uh, if I could go to, first of all, T is for Tam Bailey. Page six. T is for Tam Bailey. Page 12. We want to make sure children in Scotland have an opportunity to talk to Tam. Page 38. We ensure the office runs smoothly and Tam's aims are projected to children. And then, you know, throughout the, uh, page 40, I work in the sector. I recently became aware I believe the golden rules and I would like this. So, in actual fact, I find it difficult to get an answer to George Adams and the convener's questions, but it seems to me that uh, this is more about Tam Bailey than it is about children's rights. Apart from the fact there's over seven photographs of yourself in here, I think one would have been enough. Um, 
But, you know, I've been on the corporate body for three years, as uh, Liam MacArthur is, and uh, the questions there are different to the questions here. And if I just may say, convener, it's easy to measure the public sector ombudsman and the information commissioner because they are getting appeals all the time. Your office, uh, as a children's commissioner, is more difficult to measure, so it does provide a challenge because this committee has a very powerful position in holding to account the one and a quarter million pound of taxpayers' money that goes there. So I just think this is more about Tam's plan than it is about children's rights. And this seems to be about promoting you personally. Uh, and if perhaps you would like to get the opportunity for the third time, in my personal opinion, to answer George Adams' question, which I thought was very reasonable, and indeed the conveners, because I didn't see anything that was specifically attributed uh, to the Commissioner's Office that probably would have happened anyway. OK. Uh, I'm only the occupant of this role. I get one shot at it in terms of eight years, and my objective is to make sustainable change. And sustainable change cannot come with it just being through my office. It has to be owned by other organisations. That's why I started off by telling what I perceive to be changes in other organisations. When I came into post, then you, you wouldn't have had a presence about children's rights or children's rights training within Education Scotland. When I came into post, you didn't have a children and young people's bill that had whole sections in it about duties on ministers and duties on public bodies. And when I came into post, the, for, the, for the early part of it, there was a very weak presence within Scottish Government, and I am heartened that Scottish Government have increased the number of staff that have got responsibility for children's rights. So all of that, I, I think, my belief is that that is sustainable change for the future, regardless of who's sitting in this chair or who's sitting in this role right now. So if it truly was all driven by my office, that would not be a good place to be. It has to be driven through other institutions and bodies in Scotland, and that's been the whole approach. So I make no apology for quoting what's happening in other areas of uh, institutions in Scotland, because they are the people who will make the difference in terms of children's rights in the longer term, and they will be here long beyond the period of time that I am in post. So that, that, that's, been, that's been the whole strategy well, to try... My question was, and I mean, I lectured for 20 years before coming in here, and we were constantly doing additional CPD, we were constantly looking at what was out there, constantly looking at how we could change and how we could adapt and, you know, to serve the people that we were uh, uh, paid to serve. And, I mean, my point is, uh, would these things have happened anyway? Uh, or is it because of the Children's Commissioner that Education Scotland is suddenly speaking and bringing in training on children's rights. Uh, and, and my second point, which you haven't answered, convener, if I may, is TAM's aims. Now, you know, the Children's Commissioner's Office is not just about you. Uh, you may head up the Children's Commissioner's Office, but it's TAM's aims. Talk to T is for TAM. You know, these are about children's rights. It's not about self-promotion, which this booklet definitely seems to be about. So I would like to ask you why it's focused on you rather than on the children. And really, I go back for the fourth time now, what has happened as a specific... I mean, the legislation, to be fair, I don't think you can claim credit for it. Uh, that was the Scottish Government legislation. But is there something that you have done that has resulted in a positive outcome for children across Scotland. OK, let's give you another one then. I think all of the things that I mentioned actually do cover that, but I'll give you another one. So I'd, I'd, one of the, the results of a right blether was to look at uh, um, uh, children responding by saying they wanted to be safe and respected in their communities. When I went back to them, they said, so what would make the difference in terms of you feeling respected in your community? Uh, and it, as it happened, they said school toilets. So we've been campaigning on school toilets uh, and we've been pressing the government who've now agreed to uh, produce new guidance on school toilets. And I think that will result in, in improved approaches, improved ethos in school with regard to school toilets. And so, and I mean, this has captured the attention 
of the World Health Organization, who have a campaign called WASH, which is Water and Sanitary Health, and they are interested in the developments that are taking place in Scotland with regard to school toilets directly as a result of that campaign. Are school toilets not the responsibility of local authorities? And there are standards there, so it is their, their responsibility. And if it's, if it's not being upheld, you know, do we need you to go in and inspect the toilets in order for children to feel safe? Is that not something that councils do have a responsibility well, well, for? Well, it's all very well saying that it's the responsibility of the education uh, department. Of course it is. But if it's not happening, then you need a light shone in that, and you need a response. And thankfully, the response to the government has been that they will take that on. So, so, I mean, there's lots and lots of areas in Scottish life with children and young people where the responsibilities are quite clear and they're not being upheld. And that's one example where, in my view, it wasn't universally being upheld and we had to shine a light on it. And as a result, there's been a response, a positive response, and actually it's captured the attention of the World Health Organisation, that particular response. School toilets, but we haven't had an answer to the points I've made about TAM's plan and T is for TAM and that it's more about self promotion and it's TAM's aims rather well, than children's. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> children and young people identify with who is the children's commissioner. So very early on in my tenure, I, I visited uh, schools and it became apparent that the children genuinely want to know who is this children's commissioner, who is that person, what does that person look like, what engagement are they likely to have with that person. So I've made it one of my own aims that in any one year I'll have contact with 5,000 children and young people. Now that's pretty steep in terms of the number of schools I have to visit, in terms of the number of social uh, um, uh, care uh, places I have to visit, in terms of the number of youth clubs that I would have to visit. But that's my commitment. And that's because children and young people tend not to identify with an institution, an office of a children's commissioner, but they do identify with that person. And so therefore, again, I'm, I have the privilege of being that person for this period of time uh, and for the next person that come in, I give them the advice that you have to be a person that is recognised by children and young people. And some of the evidence on that was when we uh, um, did the right blether uh, and we did some polling with regard to the recognition of, children, of the Children's Commissioner. Much more recognition in terms of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and much lesser, I mean it was 25% of who the Children's Commissioner was. One of my ambitions is that all of the children in Scotland know exactly who their children's commissioner is. So yes, I, I, it's, it, it is a it It's is not a more person. important that all the children in Scotland know what their rights are, it, no. rather than knowing what your name no, is. No, absolutely not. I mean, it goes cap in hand. I, I've already said that one of the ambitions that I've started with is that children's rights are owned right across the board. I am very pleased that there's now curriculum development that allows children to know about the UNCRC. Teachers are confident in, in dealing with the children's rights. They're not going to shy away from it. And the advice that I was given early on in the right blether was, this won't work. You won't get teachers engaging with children's rights. That just wasn't the case. Very well, I'm just, I know she has other questions. Can I, before I move on to Liam MacArthur, I know he's, he wants to come in. Just, just for clarification, I double-checked in the report on page 19 where you talk about the flushed uh, with success campaign. You see, as part of the campaign, schools are self-assessing, etc., taking part in flushed with success. Since the launch, a total of 32 schools have taken part. Yeah, signed but, up. That doesn't seem very many, Tam. No, it's not because we've got over 3,000 establishments in Scotland. Uh -huh. uh, but those are the schools that we're informing what will go into the guidance, and it's the guidance that will make the difference. So the guidance from the government to the local no, authorities—that's uh, that's where the difference. Will obviously, make. I can see the, the importance of that. I mean, I, with the government's involvement, yeah. and that's clearly important and, and has an impact. But it was just the way you were expressing it there. It, it, it sounded to me like a lot more were involved, and yeah. actually, and, and I double-checked the numbers. And it's actually 32, which seems very low. Yeah. 
low in terms of numbers, but in terms of being able to use the quality of information that those children and young people provide to be able to input to what will then be the guidance that's given out to, to the schools. Is, I suppose my point is, Tam, is 32 a representative sample of 3,000 institutions? Ah, well, I mean, <laughs> you have to get some information. I mean, previously, uh, and in many, many instances right now, we produce guidance that doesn't have any reference to children and young people's views on it. So th there's an opportunity there to actually use those, uh, the pupils uh, who produce provided that information. So I, I, and that's one of, the, one, of the, one of the changes that I would like to see, that when we are routinely producing guidance for uh, that impact in children's lives, that we actually have got them involved in the process. It, it makes it... But I mean, it is 1%. I mean, it's not... Yes, I know that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Liam McCarthy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Tom, I, mean, I think you've, you've quite rightly um, pointed to the fact that over a period, um, the, the understanding, the awareness, um, the acceptance of the need for children's rights to be understood and, and, and respected has been established. I mean, there'll be areas where that's not necessarily um, uh, as well-founded as it, as it might. But in terms of ensuring that we get beyond just recognition to the, to the delivery of good services, treatment, etc., uh, that flow from those rights, are there any areas that you think particular attention needs to be focused on, whether that be geographically within Scotland, whether it be for certain groups of children and young people, whether it be from specific groups of professionals? You, you quoted earlier the, the, the issue of um, police stop and search, and I think uh, George drew attention to, the, um, to, to some of the changes around health visitors. So, so clearly some of those areas have been identified. Are, are, are there others where you would have particular concerns and that you believe a specific um, job of work is needed to be done um, to ensure that we move from simply the, 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 the recognition, the understanding yeah, okay. and, and the acceptance through actually to the delivery? Yes, uh, quite a long list here. I'll start with the overarching issues as, as I see them. Uh, and, and the two big uh, overarching issues for me are cutbacks in service. Uh, and if Parliament... Uh, um, was to do something in terms of how it monitors services to children and young people, then I would suggest that we actually need to look at budgeting uh, in terms of children uh, and have a clearer idea about how much resources are actually spent on children. The evidence of the 80s was that children's services suffered disproportionately. I think the discourse in that and the, the, the statements that have been made of people are trying a lot harder to not cut back services, but we simply don't know. So we don't have the information there. Uh, the second thing is allied to that. Uh, it got a very good airing uh, during the referendum debate, social justice in terms of the inequality in our country. Uh, and for me, that's the most corrosive impact on children's well-being, on children's rights. We've got, we've got massive evidence uh, that tells us that. So if, if you were looking at structural issues, those would be the ones that I would look at. Uh, this committee is well versed in where some of our failings are. Uh, we still have lesser outcomes, very much lesser outcomes, for children who are looked after, uh, despite uh, uh, report after report after report. Uh, and I think we need to take, keep the pressure on how we uh, better serve or looked after children. Uh, and likewise, I think the area of disability, which is one of my proactive areas, uh, that those children uh, need constant uh, focus on. And just for an example, uh, the play facilities uh, that children with, disabilities, children with disabilities get access to is very poor. Uh, so when you do surveying of children with disabilities and ask them about their school, uh, it tends to be uh, that they're satisfied in terms of their school life. Ask them about their social life and their life outside of that, then it's actually very poor. And we're not doing nearly enough uh, in terms of that issue. Uh, uh, you know the issue, you're well versed with transitions for uh, particularly uh, looked after young people. And despite what's in the bill, we have to be really attentive and assertive in making sure that we really do make the difference in terms of those youngsters' movement from childhood uh, into adulthood, from child-focused services uh, into adult services. So those are, some of them are structural and some of them uh, are specific to, to, to groups of youngsters. I know we're going to come on to the specific issue of, of poverty shortly, but um, yeah. maybe just in, in following that up, the, the, the points you make uh, in relation to 
uh, service cuts uh, and, and issues of poverty um, obviously aren't, aren't new. Um, they're, they're rehearsed in the report as well. But you indicated at the outset in your opening remarks that there are examples of um, individual schools uh, yes. performing well in areas where poverty clearly is more prevalent than, than in others, that, that uh, there are individuals who are um, perhaps confounding expectations. Now, is there anything from the lessons that you can draw on from that that allow us to, to, to perhaps look at ways in which yeah. progress can be made in, in, in improving the delivery of, of, of children's rights? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, we started off knowing that, I mean, every local authority knows the skills that are bucking the trend. Uh, and there's been some research produced, thankfully, from HMI, or Education Scotland now, uh, about some of the, 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 the reasons for that. Uh, uh, and there's some research from down south that one of the other reasons for that is the capacity of the school to actually engage children in, in their, uh, the normal running of the school, uh, a bit beyond school councils. So we're actually testing that just now. Uh, and I hope, I'm hopeful by the end of, before the end of the year to actually publish on that, because that would be another um, behaviour uh, that you could actually look at developing to reduce the attainment gap. So we fail miserably to actually reduce the attainment gap. And the more that we know about that, for me, the better. Uh, so we know an awful lot about the impact of inequality on children's attainment, but we don't really know enough, we don't know as much as we should about, so what about those areas that are doing remarkably well? I mean, obviously the, the, there is, um, uh, there isn't really any way of getting around the issue of budgets being more constrained at a national level, local level. Um, uh, that, uh, in a sense, what you've described would suggest that perhaps some local authorities or some service um, delivery agents are coping better with that or taking decisions that, that are impacting less adversely on, on those most in, in need. Um, so are there lessons that we can be drawing from that um, that can be rolled out uh, across different lo local authorities um, across uh, Scotland? The answer is yes. And look to those centres of excellence uh, where they're doing remarkably well. That's partly what I'm doing just now, to add to that, that volume of knowledge about the kind of behaviours, the kind of approaches that we should be promoting. Well, we're talking about schools just now that should be promoting within our educational establishments. And I think there's a growing body of evidence about the kind of things that we should be doing there. And I want to add to that. Uh, so, in answer to the question, you know, will, will I be responsible for a reduction in the attainment gap? No, because it will be the responsibility of those people who are actually uh, um, got the responsibility of providing for education. But do I want to add my, the weight of my office, the knowledge based on that? Absolutely. Uh, and I'll do what I can on that. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Colin. Thank you, Minor. Um, I'd like to explore some of the issues around the new powers oh, yeah. and the uh, investigations. Um, you have existing powers, which uh, are pretty consistent with the, the new power, if you like, of general investigation, but you've never used the existing powers. Now, presumably you're resourced to do some investigations already. And I note that uh, you're looking for additional funding per the financial memorandum of about 160,000 a year to hire more staff. So the, you've, you've never used the previous powers you had. The Additional powers, the legislation makes it clear that any investigation can only be undertaken if the issue does not come within the remit of any other public body. Now, you're estimating you'll need three further full-time members of staff. H how do you work that out? You've never used the existing powers. Some of the, some of the powers you're getting are actually similar or same to the, as the existing powers. The additional powers are limited uh, in terms of its scope. How do you calculate out three extra bodies? Yeah, uh, just uh, on the use of the existing powers, you say resourced. If you actually look at the way that the existing powers are framed, I, my reckoning is I'd need to harness the resources that we've currently got uh, to those e existing investigatory powers and not be able to exercise all of the other duties that I have under the current legislation. So that's the reason that neither myself nor my predecessor, Kathleen Marshall, were able to actually exercise that particular power of investigation. And there's examples elsewhere of how the, the use of that investigatory power actually drew 
all of the resources of the office into the use of that particular power at the expense of the exercise of the duties. Uh, so that's the first one. That's the reason that that's not been used. I understand that that power has never been used, so there's yeah, no resources right. been put behind it from your office. Uh, well, th the resources have been put into the exercise of the duties that I currently have, which prompt the questions here about the difference that we've made, about whether there's any impact on children and young people, about whether we've got any measurable success. I wouldn't have been able to actually answer any of those questions uh, if we'd put all of the powers and all of the resources into the uh, existing powers. So are you saying and that you've never used the existing powers because although there perhaps was occasions when you might have, you might have productively done so, you didn't because you didn't have resources? Uh, yeah, because the resources of the office were, were servicing the duties that I have about promoting and safeguarding children's rights, about scrutinising legislation, about trying to make some differences uh, in terms of children's lives in Scotland. So yes, absolutely. Mm. Uh, but to come back to uh, mm. the, the estimations, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure how, uh, what level of uh, discussion you're wanting on this just now, because there's a submission to the SPCB. Uh, but I think I provided evidence to the committee previously uh, about in my estimation, the hundreds of cases that would actually come the way of the office uh, and having to respond to that and having to have the capacity uh, to be able to respond to those cases. So that's, it's on that basis. Uh, and we submitted evidence uh, that was based on uh, a comparison with the uh, uh, commissioner's offices in Wales and Northern Ireland, which is really the best uh, uh, comparators we've got. We couldn't use England because they don't have any powers of investigation. I'm looking at page six of your uh, report, and you're talking about moving to new office accommodation this year, 2014-15. Um, I wondered what, what the reasons were and uh, what the cost is. Uh, the cost is we get, we get more accommodation for less cost. So, I'd, I mean, the case for that was already agreed through the Scottish Parliamentary uh, uh, corporate body. Uh, so uh, we actually get better premises, more spacious premises for less money. So it, it's much better value for money. Uh, um, and it's already been agreed. Uh, so, again, again, looking at page six here, you say that the corporate services team has had to react to external demands on the basis of our public body status. I was wondering what that meant. Um, I mean, we've... As a, as, a, as a public body, uh, there are certain additional res responsibilities that I have. Uh, so, for instance, uh, in terms of the Equality Act, uh, we have to respond to that. In terms of all of the, the, the responsibilities of a public body, I have to respond to it, even although uh, we're, a very we're a very small office. Uh, so there's one commissioner uh, and 14 staff. Uh, I, we have to respond to FOIs, we have to make sure that our governance uh, is in line with what you'd expect to any other public body. I was just looking at, uh, again, the, the new powers you're getting. Can you give an example of the type of complaint you think that you'll be faced with and that you will be proactively looking for to investigate? Yeah. Um, I frequently, or I, frequently, I, I, I've had occasion of people, for instance, where they're caring for a child with disabilities uh, and there is movement of that child, a transition of that child from childcare services to adult services and people are absolutely bereft of uh, any notion about what those uh, uh, services would be in terms of the future uh, of their child and it's very difficult for them to know where's the, uh, there's no pickup in terms of complaints because actually what they're getting in terms of an adult service is what you would normally get. But whether that is suitable for a child who's moving from child services to adult services, and this comes up frequently. I, um, I mean, there's, there's, sorry. So I was just going to say that that seems more like information and uh, guidance as much as an investigation. Uh, well, if this is happening for our children with disabilities and there are, there are uh, gaps in service provision and we spend uh, time, energy trying to provide for a good childhood for the youngster and then it falls down when we actually transfer into adulthood, I think it's a bit more than just providing advice and guidance. I think that we should actually be shining a light on that to try and do something about it. Do you think, given the new powers you're getting, do you think there should be any further powers that would enable you to more effectively perform your duties? 
Uh, I'm, I, I've got quite a bit on my plate just now, uh, making sure that the exercise of the new powers is as effective as the Parliament uh, want it to be. Uh, so I, I think for just now, I've got plenty on, on my uh, agenda uh, to make sure that I'm true to uh, the exercise of those powers. Are you satisfied that with the additional resources that uh, are apparently coming your way, that you'll be able to fully maintain your core functions and achieve your strategic objectives, that there won't be any impingement on that? Yeah, I, I have made representation in terms of the, uh, um, what might be uh, um, additional pressures on the office. Uh, I have to submit an annual budget, uh, so there'll be an opportunity there to assess whether there are sufficient resources to be able to keep all of the operations that are on the go, uh, as well as uh, the exercise of uh, the new powers. Um, and I want that to be, that, that will be reviewed. Uh, so we'll be keeping very close record in terms of the impact of the new powers in the office. These powers come into play in 2016. Uh, I see myself really uh, laying the ground for somebody else to come in uh, because my term of office ends in 2017. Uh, so, in fact, I have to uh, be mindful that it's for another commissioner uh, to come in and make those powers effective uh, beyond uh, the first year. Thank you. Before I've got a couple of members want to come in, I want to clarify a couple of points. So, before I bring them in, um, you said that if you had had, if you had carried out investigations previously, um, you would have sucked the whole resources of the office in. I think was the phrase that you used. Um, isn't that a danger going forward? That uh, effectively the same thing will happen again. Yeah, and I've already made representation to the committee and to the government uh, about allocating sufficient resources to make sure uh, that the exercise of the new extension of powers uh, uh, is properly resourced. And I, I, I suggest that uh, um, that has to be uh, kept under review because, in my estimation, uh, there, may be, there may well be a requirement for additional resources over and above that which was allocated through the financial memorandum. Uh, and I already made representation on that. However, having said that, uh, I've, we, we know what was in, in the budget, we know what was in the financial memorandum, and I give my absolute commitment to try and make that work. I think... The question, there's two questions that arise, I think, from that. Um, firstly, uh, just for clarification, what work would you have investigated? What investigations would you have taken on that you were unable to take on because of resources? You said originally you couldn't do it because the resources you had. Um, I'm, not, I'm not looking forward to the increase and the changes in your powers, but as they currently stand, what would you have investigated that you didn't? I'll go back to that example again. So instead of uh, offering advice, guidance to those parents uh, who are trying to cope with their children with disability, then an investigation, and remember the investigation is held in public, it's like a public hearing, then there would have been an opportunity uh, to have many parents, if you like, uh, present their case as to the kind of uh, um, lack of service uh, for that particular group of children. And that would have been quite a big exercise, quite a big undertaking. I, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it, I, Mr. Beattie was seemed to be, uh, on his line of questioning, talking about the, the information you'd be prov would prov providing would be more of an information and advice rather than an investigation, uh, which I, I kind of agreed with the line of questioning he was asking you. That yeah. seemed to be what it was like. Um, because people were unsure of what services they would be getting if they're moving from child services no, to adult I, services. I, I, um, isn't it isn't it feasible to provide that kind of information, advice and support from your office with 14 staff at the moment? Yeah, uh, just to correct, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be just about the, the purpose of an investigation, wouldn't be just to provide advice and guidance. It would be actually to seek changes in the way that we deal with children, for instance, in this instance, uh, with disabilities uh, and make sure that they have a proper transition into adulthood. And in fact, the advice and guidance is already given right now. So I, the committee will be aware that I've, I've run an inquiry service, somewhere between three and 400 uh, inquiries a year, where I don't have the capacity uh, to follow up in individual cases, but we give advice and guidance on numerous cases uh, that come to the office, uh, either in terms of parents seeking advice with regards to uh, the schooling of their child, 
or with regards to the health of their child or with regards to um, housing or rights of their child. We give that advice and information right now. We don't call them investigations. I can't call them investigations. I don't have the power of individual investigations on those. So what's the difference? What's the difference between what you do now and the advice and information that you provide and an investigation? What, I mean, what, what's, the, what's, the additional, what's the additional benefit? It, it, it would be similar to the powers that are exercised by other complaints bodies where you would actually be able to request papers, you would be able to actually get full information rather than us just dealing uh, with the parent uh, and, or the child uh, and listening to that side of the story. So you would be able to properly investigate on the basis of the paperwork that you would have access to. Okay. Um, Mary? Uh, well, it's just a small uh, uh, brief supplementary convener and um, what I would like to ask is how many investigations did you turn down? Uh, you've mentioned the parents with children with disabilities. Now, as, as a member of parliament, I would be very concerned if there's a serious, serious need out there and that your office, you know, that, that desperately needed an investigation, your office were unable to deal with it because all of the resources of 14 staff would go into that investigation. So how many did you turn down? Did you discuss turning down investigations into particular needy issues with government ministers? Or did you indeed discuss it with the corporate body, of which I was a, a member prior to... Uh, sitting on this committee and just my final point convener is looking forward to the future and obviously I've got information from the corporate body here how many cases do you anticipate uh, will be investigated annually in future for your three new members of staff um, okay uh, it's not a matter of turning down investigations and people coming and saying we need this investigating you need to uh, you know use that collective power of, uh, that power of investigation that you have uh, but I mean just recently for instance there's uh, um, you, you want to know where things have been flagged up to government there's been a report produced which flagged up I seem to be concentrating on youngsters with disability but it is a big bit of the work uh, where uh, there are questions over how effectively uh, um, we interview children uh, in terms of child protection uh, investigations, children with communication difficulties. And I've already flagged that up to the government because I think the government actually uh, need to look at how we improve services on that. Uh, you're asking the number of uh, uh, the estimate of number of cases, uh, not uh, number of cases that would be made in terms of referrals, in terms of complaints, and based on the estimates from Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, and the number of children that we have in Scotland, we've estimated over 800 uh, complaints would actually come uh, to the office to be dealt with. They wouldn't all result in investigations because. The, uh, it, but the, we would actually have to deal uh, with that number of cases. But my understanding was, and you respond, your answer to Colin Beatty was that, if I understand it correctly, you have a power to investigate prior to the Children and Young People's Act. You would have carried out these investigations, only you were not fully resourced for it, and it would have sucked in all your resources. Mm. So what I was asking was, what should have been done that wasn't, you weren't able to do because of resources, and also your anticipated cases in future? Now, if I'm right from memory, it's not 800 investigations in a year. No, if I remember correctly, it's probably one or two, or maybe none. Ah. Well, Would that be right? It depends on what you call an investigation. I'm talking about complaints that we've made to the office that have to be uh, assessed, where we have to get information, and where, in many instances, we'll give advice and information and signposting. Uh, and there's been an estimate provided by the government in terms of somewhere between one and four investigations would result from that. Uh, I, we're, we're, that's part of the reason that I want this actually uh, kept under review, uh, because I think there will be a very heavy workload in terms of complaints that are made to the office, which will result in the office having uh, to respond to them. But you're not, sorry, convener, you're not allowed to undertake any investigation but, where that would duplicate the work of any other complaint handling body. That's Scottish government's words. So where, where is there in Scotland? where the, there is not a complaint handling body that would undertake these investigations that 
would have to come to you. Yeah. Where, where is that gap? I mean, you, because you're not allowed to duplicate. Absolutely. And you have to go back to the definition of what would be a complaint, to be the basis of a complaint that would be made to my office. Uh, and that's on the basis of rights, interests and views of children uh, not being properly taken into account. And there's lots of scope there in terms of the number of complaints that would be made. Just looking for an answer, convener. I'm uh, sorry, but I'm, I'm not getting it. And I'm trying quite hard, and I think I'm being quite respectful here. But, you know, where it was a straightforward question. Where is there... Uh, the Commissioner may not undertake such an investigation where that would duplicate the work of any other complaint handling body. Where is there in Scotland that we do not have a complaint handling body that would justify you undertaking investigations? Just give me one. I've already given you, I think, oh, really? one, but I'll give you, I'll give you another one. Okay. So, uh, a young person leaves care at age 15. Uh, um, there's no continuing care responsibility uh, for the local authority, and at 17, finds themselves homeless and without any support, and wants to complain about the behaviour of the local authority in terms of the exercise of their duty. Now, the, the, the local authority may well have exercised their responsibilities at that age, but whether that is the kind of outcome and whether that takes proper account of that child's best interest at that age is open to question. And that's the kind of thing, that they, they, they don't neatly fall in to a complaint being made on that basis to any one of our bodies. Liam yeah. MacArthur. Perhaps start by partially answering Colin Beattie's question in, in relation to office space, because I think it's probably one more fairly directed to the corporate body. I mean, against uh, an attempt to decrease the, 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 the budget of the corporate body by about 11 per cent over five years, what we've done, amongst other things, is asked all of the, um, uh, the office holders and, and commissioners to look at opportunities for co-locating and sharing back services. So part of the office move is a reflection of, of, uh, of a, a responsibility, a requirement that the corporate body is placed on, on, uh, on TAM and the other office holders. Uh, but in relation to um, the, uh, the issue of investigation, I mean, this came up during the consideration of the of the Children and Young People's uh, Bill. I think at the time um, you pointed to a role um, in terms of uh, almost mediation prior to a complaint being made. But what you seem to be talking about now in, in response to, to Mary Collin and the convener's questions is actually an investigative power over, uh, over complaints. And the examples you've used seem to me to fall um, largely into the into the category of the sort of complaint that ultimately the ombudsman uh, would would look to investigate after local avenues had been uh, exhausted. Now, it may well be that you, you point to um, uh, your role in, in overseeing sort of rights and the views of children, young people, etc. But that looks like it's it, it, it's looking at a distinct. Um, aspect of the same case that the Ombudsman would be looking to uh, or required to investigate. So I'm, I'm struggling to understand whether yep. or not there are distinct roles or whether you'd end up having a complaint that was simultaneously being looked at by the Ombudsman uh, by yourself, albeit looking at no. slightly different aspects of the same case. No, I, I, I think, I mean, one of the tasks between now and the setting up of the, uh, um, the power uh, is actually to develop memorandum of understanding with the, our existing complaints bodies, uh, including uh, the ombudsperson. Uh, because I think in many instances, there will be signposting uh, to those other complaint handling uh, bodies. But we will still have to have resources to be able to uh, assess uh, what the advice and information would be and whether it's appropriate to, to actually signpost. Um, I, mean, I, I, mean, I think going back to your earlier um, uh, points about the, the role that you have in raising awareness and raising understanding, etc. I mean, it, it's, it's quite a high profile uh, role and there's, yeah. been, there's yeah. been some success with that. Is there not a danger that whatever the memorandums of understanding are, are saying, that actually for those with a, a complaint, there's going to be um, an incentive, an attraction, um, an inevitability that they gravitate towards yourself rather than actually going down the route of pursuing the avenues that currently exist. Yeah, well, that'll be for us to work out with the ombudsperson. I certainly, I think I'd try to reassure the committee. Uh, I'm not interested in setting up uh, uh, parallel processes. I don't think that would be helpful at all. Uh, uh, but I do think that uh, by uh, having an individual complaint handling function, that that will 
uh, attract young people uh, to come to the office. Uh, and then it'll be up to us to do proper assessment on that and proper signposting in those cases that it's appropriate. I mean, you've drawn on the examples of uh, Wales and Northern Ireland in, yeah. in terms of estimating the likely workload that this may, um, may result in. Is there anything from their kind of institutional landscape of, of commissioners and other bodies that would give us some confidence that yeah. those memorandum of understanding can be applied in a way that makes yes. sense? To, yeah. to, to in, in fact, one, one, one of the main uh, lessons to be learned of the, um, uh, this power uh, in Northern Ireland and Wales is that the intervention of the Children's Commissioner actually prompts a resolution uh, and gets the matter resolved rather than uh, having to actually go to a uh, formal complaint. Uh, and that's one of their main findings, uh, that it helps children and young people before it has to go through formal complaint. And that's just by the very intervention of the Commissioner's Office. So isn't that back at the mediation? Well, I, I, I've, never used, I've never used the word mediation. Well, well whatever we want to call it. <laughs> uh, whatever well, we want to call it. I mean, Liam MacArthur asked you, right, I think his first question mm -hmm. was on this point about that we previously discussed, let's just call it mediation because that's what I've used I, 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 at I, that I, point. And now we're talking about a different form of investigation parallel to or not. The, the, yeah, the I, 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 I'm just trying to understand it. I've never used the word mediation. In fact, I think Scottish Government have made representation at the committee that they don't see it as a, a mediation role. But the evidence is that when referrals are made or when complaints are made to the Commissioner's Office and the Commissioner's Office becomes involved, then that uh, prompts people uh, to look at how they would resolve it before uh, they need to go through uh, complaints. In that sense, that could be a good outcome because it's, it, it gets uh, some resolution before it goes through formal complaint. I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad outcome. I'm just yep. trying to understand what the, how, what the role is um, because I'm now slightly struggling between <laughs> intervening at that point, whatever we call it, and that prompts a resolution, which on the face of it would, would appear to be a, a good outcome. Yep. And in the discussion we've just had about an investigatory role parallel to but investigating something slightly different through memorandums of understanding with the Ombudsman? I, 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 I was trying to say that I don't think there should be parallel investigations at all. I think that the memorandum of understanding should actually about separating out those times when the Commissioner's Office becomes involved and when the Ombudsperson comes involved. After, I don't think it would be it helpful. Is it after the Ombudsman has completed their investigation then? Um, no, I would say if, if it was the Ombudsperson that was conducting the investigation, that would be it. I mean, they, they've conducted, I, 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 I've previously said that I don't want uh, or I don't foresee this as being some further adjudication. Uh, the Ombudsperson got a very clear role there and that would be, sorry, I'm, I would I'm, see I'm, that I'm, being the resolution I'm, of I'm, it. I'm more confused now, sorry Tam, I mean, I'm genuine, I'm trying to, so if the Ombudsman is, is dealing with the case then you, you definitely wouldn't be involved? Uh, we haven't worked out the detail of it, but that would be my, that, that's how I'm going into these discussions, yeah. If the Ombudsman is dealing with the cases your understanding is you wouldn't be involved. So, so what are the sorry, and what are the cases then you would be involved in if the if the if the except because the cases the examples you gave seem to be cases that would go to the ombudsman. Mm. That's what they sounded like. Okay, uh, I'll give you another a case where I don't think there's any clear place that it goes. Okay. Uh, there's a there's a an issue come into the office just now. Uh, a youngster with disabilities uh, who has been asked by uh, the bank uh, because of their disability for additional uh, 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 safeguards uh, to be made before uh, the bank uh, allow a bank account to be taken out. The inquiry to us is, is this, uh, does this in any way infringe this young person's rights? Uh, now, there may be a bigger issue here about the behaviour of our financial institutions in terms of discriminatory behaviour uh, with our children and young people. I can't see that going to the public service ombuds person. Liam McCarthy. Coming back to the, the, the point, I mean, I think if there's a, if there's a successful resolution um, that, that avoids the need for a complaint, I mean, obviously yes. that would appear to be an objective that, that everybody would wish to see. But 
The, the office holders at the moment, including the Ombudsman, um, can only intervene at a point where all local avenues have been exhausted. Now, the example, the response you gave to the convener there suggested that, in a sense, if this was to be prior to complaint being made, all avenues, local avenues, wouldn't necessarily have been exhausted. That, that perhaps in the cases you were, you were citing there, there may yeah. be an engagement by you and your office with a local authority um, that, that had been taking an approach in terms of the, the, the transition um, from, uh, to, to, to adulthood in terms of delivery of services that wasn't respecting of the rights. But that would, that would suggest that you have a, a right of involvement um, that uh, isn't necessarily an investigation, but, but isn't akin to the, the, the right of investigation the other um, office holders have, in particular the, the Ombudsman, because you're not waiting for local avenues um, to have been exhausted. Yeah, and it might be that that's the best resolution in the case at that point, but that's where the memorandum of understanding would, 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 would the ground that it would cover to make sure that we weren't dealing with something that should actually rightly go to the Ombudsperson uh, in, in the first instance. So I've given you the example, for instance, of the behaviour of uh, financial institutions. Earlier I gave you an example of parents uh, who felt that the young people were being excluded from sporting activity uh, on the basis of what looked like quite a, a, a resolvable uh, a dispute. It's not clear that that would go to the, the public service ombudsman person because that's not uh, part of a public body. So there are a number of other, if you like, uh, areas where they're just not covered by our uh, um, complaints uh, landscape right now, especially when you're looking at where the rights of children would have been infringed or not uh, by bodies that are not public service, that are not uh, covered uh, by the public service ombudsperson. I, I don't want to drag this out because other, other members have got questions in other areas. So I want, I want to just finish on, on, on a quick question, if you don't mind. You mentioned financial institutions there, a bank. Bank, I was mentioning bank, yeah. And um, your role could be in, in supporting this individual, maybe with disabilities, who's being perhaps discriminated against um, in terms of the activity of the bank. But it seems to me, well, that's an interesting example, but the bank has no duty to engage with you or, you know, effectively has... Effectively, you can, you can ask them, you know, but you mentioned earlier what you bring is the ability of an investigation to look at the papers and examine the evidence yeah. and all that. But a, a private institution has, has no duty whatsoever to engage with you or provide you with any evidence, papers or anything else. So it sounds more like almost like a kind of voluntary advocacy role rather than an investigative role in the formal sense. Yeah, and there'll be a whole number of issues that come which are about infringements of rights where I would expect the Commissioner to uh, get involved. Now, the extent of the involvement will depend on the nature of the complaint, will depend on, uh, um, to some extent, uh, the cooperation uh, of those bodies. I agree with that. Okay. I, said, I didn't want to drag that out, but thank you for that. Uh, uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, Tam, you, you said in page 7 of your report and your opening remarks that one in five of our uh, children live in poverty. And you also recorded your extreme disquiet about the failure to make sufficient progress in reducing the number of our children who live in poverty. What do you consider your role to be in helping to tackle child poverty? Um, there's a role in the extent that my job is about promoting and safeguarding children's rights. Uh, so there's a responsibility there uh, um, to highlight issues that I think are infringing, uh, impinging uh, on children's rights. And I said earlier that it's my belief uh, that there's evidence that demonstrates the negative impact, the corrosive impact, I would describe it, that child poverty has on children's life chances, and that translates to their enjoyment and their rights. So these are children who have got lesser uh, uh, attainment levels at school, whose mental health is impacted as a result of living in poverty, who in fact the, the longevity of their life is impacted uh, because of poverty. So for me that is the single most uh, uh, influential factor in whether children in Scotland, uh, all children in Scotland, have got enjoyment of their rights or not. Uh, and I, 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 am, I am supportive uh, of actions where we actually take seriously uh, the reduction of uh, the income inequality that we experience in Scotland. 
So, uh, you know, are you in agreement that the efforts to deliver on childcare, eh, sorry, children's rights are being undermined or even negated by child poverty? Uh, yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's another way of putting it. Uh, uh, the evidence is international. It's not just uh, in terms of Scotland. It's not just in terms of the UK. It's right across the board. Oh, also, in your opening report, remarks, you said, uh, despite our efforts, remedial actions do not counter the destructive impact on children born into families living in poor circumstances. This will continue as long as we live in an unequal society. Child poverty is the single most negative factor in too many of our children's lives, and the eradication of it is the single most significant influence in the better realisation of their rights. So, given the devolution settlement, you know, that welfare and, and the level of the minimum wage, etc., is reserved to Westminster, um, what engagement have you had with the UK Government on these issues? Um, the engagement has been jointly uh, through the, uh, um, the four commissioners, because uh, the, 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 these are reserved matters. Uh, so we choose to do that jointly, making representation uh, to the government, uh, the publication of joint reports, uh, which formed the basis of uh, um, uh, the report to the, the committee in Geneva, uh, and particularly making a meeting uh, with Lord Freud uh, uh, prior to the implementation of uh, um, the cuts uh, in terms of welfare, uh, and particularly we focused uh, on the, the areas that would affect children and young people. And how would you um, measure that the success of that level of engagement? Well, this is yet another one of those where there are a number of uh, bodies, a number of institutions, a number of individuals uh, who would want to make their views known uh, in terms of uh, child poverty. Uh, so we're not a lone voice, uh, but I think that it's appropriate uh, that we make that joint voice of the children's commissioners uh, heard uh, in this, this whole field. Um, I mean, that, that's to the UK government. I think there are things within the, uh, the Scottish uh, government, within their uh, power, uh, to actually look at uh, um, alleviating the impact of poverty, as there are uh, at local government level. This is the most complicated uh, uh, area of social policy, because you actually need the UK government, the Scottish government, and local government uh, uh, all pointing in the same direction and pulling in the same direction. Uh, and that can be quite, uh, given our, our constitutional uh, position, that can be quite a complicated matter. Yeah. So, so what changes would you like to see to take place to tackle this then? Um, I think there are things about uh, the um, wage levels. Uh, so what we have is half of our children who are living in poverty are actually living in families where they're earning wages, uh, where, there's a, where there's somebody working. Uh, we have uh, uh, levels of uh, payment for childcare, uh, which actually mitigate against, uh, in many instances, uh, people being freed up uh, to go to work. Uh, um, and we still have uh, um, children who, in Scotland, uh, are uh, turning up to school with lesser uh, cognitive development as a result of uh, uh, living in poverty. So it, it does a, a bit of an there's a real urgency here. Uh, one of my one of my hopes uh, is that the focus on early years uh, and improvements in early years uh, will actually help uh, and, um, counteract some of our, our structural uh, inequality. But unless we do that, unless we tackle that, and unless there's a, a will right across the board, then, as I said in the report, I think we will continue to uh, produce some children who've got lesser life chances as a result of, of living in poverty. I mean, you've just touched on the, the Early Years Collaborative, and, and you as a commissioner, as a, as a member of, of that body, given um, that you've said that many of the, the pe people that are in poverty are, are working families, um, what is the likely success of the Early Years Collaborative, given this background? Yeah, uh, I mean, we can go so far with the Collaborative. I mean, I've already given a welcome uh, to the um, additional health visitors. Uh, I think that uh, there, there will be very significant progress made as a result of the Collaborative. Uh, I think that we are much better attuned 
to good parenting. We now know uh, about the impact of good parenting on those positive outcomes for children and young people. Uh, or particularly uh, in the early years, uh, people are, are harnessing resources to be able to support families better in those early years. The health visitors will provide regular checks to be able to pick up on children uh, where there may be delays in development so as you can actually respond to that quickly. Uh, however, uh, unless the, we actually live in a society that's much more, uh, there's a much narrower gap between the have and the have nots, we will still have some families and some children who struggle uh, in the, the circumstances in which they live. Uh, so uh, the, the will, there's, a, there's a great deal that can be uh, achieved through early years endeavours, early years collaborative endeavours, but that overall structural inequality has to actually be, be looked at and dealt with. Thank you. Thanks. Neil. Uh, staying on the issue of poverty, you, you've mentioned uh, one section of your report, it all comes down to money, and you're talking about inequality there. What has and what is the Children's Commissioner's Office been lobbying the Scottish Government to target its resources on children living in poverty, right. given obviously we're, we're living in a time of straightened finances? Yeah. The, the quote, it all comes down to money, is actually a quote from a parent with a child with disability. Uh, um, and that almost was going to be the title of, uh, 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 well, uh, that, that really summed up the kind of uh, uh, experiences of those parents uh, who are trying, who, who've got a much higher uh, chance of, of living in poverty. So, in terms of uh, um, government actions, uh, I've been actively encouraging government to look at uh, how we can uh, alleviate some of those costs in terms of uh, uh, childcare, and looking at how, in particular, they could alleviate the burden on families with uh, youngsters who are particularly vulnerable. I've already mentioned uh, a focus on uh, children and young people who are looked after, uh, and certainly uh, uh, families uh, where there's a, a parent with disability. Um, so, like I said, these are quite co these are complex matters. There isn't any one action. Uh, is going to uh, bring us that more equal society. Uh, and my, my urge really is actually to all politicians uh, uh, to be uh, focused uh, on how we become a more equal society. Um, given that we're going to see the rollout of um, free school meals for all pupils, primary one to primary three, regardless of, of, of income, I don't know if you're aware, but Renfrewshire Council provides meals in a non-stigmatised way to um, pupils living in poverty during school holidays. Moving forward, would you like to see, you know, you're talking about there not being one, you know, fixed issue of poverty. Um, would you like to see the, the government take a targeted approach to um, supporting children living in poverty, or is it, is it a more universal approach that you would like to see moving forward? Right. It's both. Uh, so you have to use your universal resources wisely, uh, but you also have to uh, have in reserve uh, some additional resources for those families and those uh, uh, children who are in the most difficult circumstances. And if I was to say, I, I think that uh, um, uh, the rollout of free school meals uh, should be accompanied by uh, some assessment of the impact uh, that that has had uh, on children's uh, eating habits, on children's well-being, uh, because these are uh, measures which are universal. So you want to test whether that's actually having the, the impact uh, that the government desire it. Can, you mentioned about uh, uh, parents with uh, disabilities, um, children with disabilities earlier. Can I just ask you a quick question on that? Um, a number of education departments across the country are reporting um, overspends on additional support needs budgets. Um, I think you've, you've, you've been critical of local authorities and, and the lack of support. Is, are you actively lobbying the Scottish Government on, on the issue of additional support needs? Um, I've got staff that are involved in working groups in terms of uh, additional support needs to make sure uh, that our legislation is implemented uh, as faithfully uh, as it was passed. In most instances, uh, when we are reporting to a uh, UN committee, it's not about not having the, the sufficient legislation. It's actually about failed legislation. Uh, and our additional support for learning is a good example 
where we had a very ambitious uh, additional support for Learning Act, uh, where we have consistently struggled to implement that uh, to the full extent, and so it continues. Uh, so I'll continue to press uh, to make sure that the provisions in the Additional Support for Learning Act uh, actually uh, uh, realised the ambition when people actually passed it many years ago. Yeah, thank you. Jane Baxter. Morning. Um, as Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People, how do you see your role working alongside the children's lobby in Scotland, I understand that your role is largely about safeguarding and promoting children's rights, but there's an active and, and, and organised children's lobby. Do you have a, a formal relationship with them? How, how does that work in practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, we're jointly involved in terms of the monitoring of UNCRC in Scotland, along with uh, Together, which is a, a representative organisation uh, of children's rights. Uh, we work with many organisations uh, in terms of uh, um, coordinating or coordinating efforts. Is, is, uh, in terms of how we would uh, position ourselves uh, with regard to particular issues. Uh, I, I, although we've got a, a, or I've got a close relationship, I, I'm mindful of the fact that the Children's Commissioner Office is, is quite unique. Uh, so I, um, I'll be very supportive of our children's sector, uh, um, but um, I'm, it's not a voluntary organisation. This is the Children's Commissioner with particular uh, responsibilities and a particular relationship uh, with Parliament, particularly in, in terms of uh, I'm responsible for budgeting, uh, but Parliament, to its credit, has set the, the, the body up. Uh, in a very independent way, and I'm always mindful uh, of that. Uh, so I'm not. I, I can I can say things uh, in an independent way, but yes, there's a, there's a relationship, there, but not not solely with the children's sector. Uh, I mean, uh, sorry, the children's lobby, as as you put it. Uh, uh, there's a relationship there with local authorities. I'm trying to we're, we're change hearts and minds. Uh, I've already talked at length about that, and with the larger bodies who've got responsibility uh, for implementing uh, legislation and policy. Okay, um, you've, you've made a number of references this morning to to parents and parents' rights, and I think that's very interesting. And a phrase we often use is, is hard to reach, and, and I prefer to think that some parents are easy to ignore. And I wonder what your view is of, of promoting parents' rights um, in the context of it actually um, being a benefit to their children. I'm, I'm thinking of um, the rights to additional support needs, preschool education, placing requests, religious observance. There's a number of, of, of things in education where parents have rights might not be aware, and if they had a great awareness, it would, would be, have an impact on, on their children. Yeah, and all of those are children's rights, actually. Uh, so, uh, I mean, in Scotland, we talk a lot about asset-based approaches. Uh, my view is that the biggest asset that we have are the parents of our children. Uh, and in fact, uh, much of what I've been talking about in terms of early years provision of early, early year support is, is really geared towards the better assistance of parents in developing that good attached relationship with their children, because that's our best hope for those children uh, becoming the well-adjusted adults of the future that we want them to be. So I, I don't have a, I have a difficulty uh, in focusing on how parents can better uh, or can provide, particularly in the earliest years of children's lives, uh, better environments, better attached relationships, a better understanding and attunement uh, to the needs of their children. For me, that, that's a, a, a just a fundamental requirement to ensure that children have got the care and attention and develop and nurture uh, that uh, we expect them to have. And so have you had the opportunity, or would you like the opportunity, to, to articulate that more formally? Um, has there been occasions where, where you've, you've had the chance to say that there's an issue about parents' rights or they need to be promoted I, 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 more I tend widely. not to put it in terms of parents' rights. I would put it in terms of uh, support that we would give to parents uh, to make sure uh, that they've got the best chance possible uh, uh, to rear their children. Uh, um, so, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, it, for me, uh, it's just one of the fundamental building blocks of producing children who are the best adjusted that they can possibly be. Uh, and, and parents, are, parents are, are key in that respect. 
I agree. <laughs> um, uh, moving on, uh, uh, page 46 of your report, I think it's the very last page, um, you make some reference to the work of the European Network of Ombudspersons, and I understand that you're the chair-elect, yeah. and it says that um, your office is going to coordinate the international work programme, focusing on the impact of austerity on children and young people in Europe. What will that mean in practice for your office? And we've had a lot of discussion this morning about resources, the impact on resources. What, what will that mean that your office will do? Well, it's just happened. Uh, and in fact, on Friday, the Enoch uh, meeting took place here in this very room. Uh, and the coordination or the, 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 the mountain of, the, pro of the, the General Assembly, sorry, the annual conference in the General Assembly uh, and the coordination of the International Work Programme was funded jointly by the European Union and the Council of Europe. Uh, so in terms of financial resources, it was very modest in terms of what we uh, had to uh, contribute to that. Uh, in terms of the outcome, uh, there's been the production of 32 two-minute films of children in eight European countries depicting what it was like for them uh, to be living in poverty. The Council of Europe uh, are very keen to assist uh, in terms of uh, that becoming uh, developed into an educational resource, uh, but it's a bit early to say that just now because it only took place uh, on, on Friday. Uh, um, so it was a great honour to be hosting uh, our 100 uh, guests uh, in Dynamic Earth uh, and a lesser number because it was a closed meeting uh, uh, with the, the network on Friday. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Martina. you. Uh, John McAlpine. Yes, just to follow on from that point, you talked about the support that you get from Europe. What would be the impact on your organisation if um, the UK withdrew from Europe after an out referendum? I think there would be um, significant changes uh, in terms of uh, the kind of uh, um, society that we had in Scotland. Um, um, so, I, I mean, I'll be... A, a <laughs> I don't quite know how you're, you're, what you want me to say in response. Uh, <laughs> talk there about some of the support that you get from Europe, and I just wondered if you could talk specifically well, I, about, you know, if there was a I, threat to that support yeah, if we well, left Europe. Yeah, I, I gain a lot. Our office gains a lot in terms of that European network. Uh, and what's become apparent uh, in the production of that international uh, work is that the similarities of children who are living in austerity and poverty across Europe are much greater, very much greater, uh, than any of the differences. Uh, so, I, I, would, I mean, my estimation is that a withdrawal from Europe uh, would have very significant impact uh, on Scottish society or on the UK uh, society. Uh, um, but beyond that, we have got lots to do. Uh, within the confines of uh, where we're at with children and young people in Scotland. And obviously related to that, there's the, the other issue about the UK government's current attitude to the Human, right, Human Rights Act. And um, Do you think that would have an impact if, that, if the landscape changed there? Yes. That would. And in fact, we'll be making representation to the Smith Committee uh, on that mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, the government of today has made... Uh, um, statements uh, and intention with regard to the human rights legislation, uh, which would impact, I think, on human rights uh, uh, bodies, uh, and particularly the impact of the Act, uh, because uh, even although there's a, an opt-out uh, in terms of uh, um, Scottish Parliament, uh, there would still be public bodies, uh, national public bodies that wouldn't be covered by the Human Rights Act uh, if there was a, a repeal of that. So, I, I, in fact, we'll be uh, making representation to the Seal Committee, uh, sorry, to the, to the Smith Committee uh, on that. Is there any possible way to illustrate how that impact might have on in individual children? Is it possible to give an example of, of a kind of negative impact that you would be concerned about? I think, I mean, the, the level of debate just now is much more about uh, our approach to human rights and children's rights. Uh, and I, I perceive a very different uh, conversation taking place within 
Scottish Parliament and within Scottish society than that which is taking place in Westminster, which I perceive to be much more hostile uh, towards uh, uh, human rights and children's rights. Uh, and I would, I would be uh, concerned if there was uh, the actions in Westminster uh, had some repercussions uh, in Scotland, because as I said at the beginning, uh, I'm hopeful for the direction of travel or where we're at in Scotland for children's rights. And I certainly wouldn't want this to be uh, affected by any rollback or any actions that were taken at Westminster that would negatively impact on that. And I've already said, I think the repeal of the Human Rights Act would negatively impact on that. A short supplementary from Liam. Uh, sorry, I'm sure Joe McAlpine didn't mean um, to uh, set a misleading tone there, but the uh, position in relation to the Human Rights Act, as I understand it, is in relation to the position of the Conservative Party rather than the UK Government. And I'm sure um, Tam Bailey would agree that in relation to... Well, it's an important I stand point. corrected. Well, I stand corrected. thank you. I, I, I would that my colleague on the committee uh, would do likewise. But in terms of the interventions of, of Westminster, that debate um, is it, as it is, but it finds as many fierce advocates in defence of the Human Rights Act um, as it does uh, those who, for their own bizarre reasons, uh, wish to undermine it. Okay. Uh, the answer that. I don't no. think it was a question. It was more of a statement no, no. than a, Indeed. Than a question. That's fine. I, and I stand corrected, Liv. Okay. Uh, uh, just just to, to, to finish off this morning, I want to get two points. Uh, the first one is, in your um, strategic plan 2012-2016, there were four um, uh, strategic aims. Uh, and one of them was about the uh, efficiency, effectiveness and fit for purpose of the office. Um, taking those three points into account, do you think you have achieved those aims uh, during this uh, period of the plan and does your office provide value for money? I have already given some example of that. Uh, and so in looking at the, um, the accommodation, for instance, uh, we are now uh, looking at uh, certainly getting much better value for money uh, in terms of accommodation. Uh, I think uh, that in terms of the overall uh, impact of the office, uh, that we are part of that movement in terms of uh, um, better children's rights, better uh, approach uh, to children's rights. So uh, the answer is uh, yes. I do think I, I suppose, I mean, uh, that's maybe my fault in the way that I worded the question, but I didn't really mean how much the office rent costs. What I meant was value for money in, in terms of the impact of your office, the office of commissioner. Yeah, well, we've already made comparisons uh, with Northern, I Northern Ireland and Wales. Uh, and in fact, we're a smaller office uh, serving larger communities uh, of children uh, in those uh, constituencies in those uh, jurisdictions. So I think already uh, you're having good value for money in terms of the presence of the office. Uh, and I would actually relate that to the progress that I think has been made uh, in Scotland with regard to children's rights. Okay. Very short, Mary. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Gamir. <clears throat> uh, having read the 47 pages, I was looking at what you've done in the past year to justify value for money and an effective office convener. And uh, out of the 47 pages, I could find one paragraph in the plans for 2014-15, which was that the Commissioner intends to build on the website. And I just wonder if the... It didn't seem very much, not only are we scrutinising what has been done, but I was looking for some gems of the plans for the future, and I got a paragraph on the website, and I thought the Commissioner may take this opportunity to... Thank you. OK. For the future. Right. Future in terms of uh, this year. Uh, we're halfway through the year, uh, so I've already given you detail of uh, the activity... Uh, through the European uh, network of ombuds uh, persons for children, uh, I've already given you the uh, um, the, uh, the international work programme that we've been coordinating. Uh, we have actually produced, and I've covered it, some of it here, uh, the learning lessons with regard to close, or looking at to children in poverty. Uh, we are about to produce uh, um, a report which looks at those high-performing schools and what are the characteristics of those. Uh, we're about to pick up on the uh, uh, domestic abuse uh, agenda. Uh, we published a report last year uh, which was highlighting the tendency of courts 
uh, in terms of whether they granted uh, contact with the alleged perpetrator or not. I now am committed to looking at how we improve the way that the views of children and young people are taken into account uh, and given greater uh, confidence in the courts about the views of those children and young people. Uh, in terms of campaigning, I've given you some of the detail of the uh, uh, school toilets and I'm given notice about continuing to uh, shine a light and campaign, if you like, uh, for changes uh, in our stop and search. In regard to disability, uh, there's a whole work stream there uh, which is continually to try and keep uh, the focus on the impact uh, of service cuts uh, on those children and young people. Thank you very much. There was one final question which I did want to ask, um, which is on a different issue. Um, you have mentioned disability a number of times, quite, yeah, quite yeah. rightly so, um, Tam. Um, I presume that you, do you effectively test you, the material that you publish for its, its accessibility to people with disabilities. Yeah, and I mean one of the key part, one of the key responsibilities of the office under uh, uh, the Quality uh, Act is to make sure that uh, they're as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we've been doing some work on, on the website and we are about to uh, commission a piece of work to make sure that our communications are as, uh, as uh, accessible as possible. The reason I ask it is, is because I have to be honest and say that I didn't think this was a particularly accessible yeah. document. I'm not sure that purple on purple with small size text would be particularly accessible to somebody with a a difficulty with their site, for example. I okay. just wondered, and, and, this, and that's just one. The other pages are the same. You've got blue on blue. So, I mean, it doesn't seem to me that, and I may be wrong. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't look like this has been properly tested for somebody who would have difficulty with their site to be able to read this. Okay, I'll take note for next year. Okay, thank you very much. Now, can I thank you very much for coming along today um, and for your evidence, it's been very welcome. I'd just let you know, before we, we met today, we had a quick discussion. We think this would be a valued uh, piece of our work to, uh, to bring you along each year um, in terms of the uh, annual report, because I know we haven't done that in the past as a, a regular occurrence, but I think the committee is quite keen that we do that, because I think both yourself and, uh, and, uh, and us gain an awful lot out of this kind of session. And I've already said that I welcome it, and I welcome in future years as well. Okay, thank okay, you very much thank for you. your attendance this morning. Thank you. Our next item uh, today is to consider the Teachers' Pension Scheme Scotland Regulations 2014. Uh, as members will see from the papers, the Scottish Government has, has indicated its intention to revoke the instrument and replace it with a corrected version. This move is in response to the concerns highlighted by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in its report on the instrument. Now, the process of finalising a replacement instrument has already begun. All the corrections have now been made to a revised instrument, which will be signed by the relevant Scottish Government Minister this week. Uh, following that, the instrument uh, will be issued to HM Treasury for its consideration and signature. The Government expects the revocation date to be the 1st of January 2015. However, we are being asked to consider the instrument that is before us today. Two sections of the instrument come into force on the 1st of December, Parts 1 and Parts 2. Part 1 is interpretive and no changes are being made to what is in Part 2. This means that on the 1st of January, an identical Part 2 will replace the provision that will by then be in force. Do members have any comments to wish to make on this instrument? Yes. Mary. <coughs> Convener, I just went back to the evidence session on the 18th of March and uh, there were questions that I raised there which I would uh, be very grateful for clarification. Um, so if I may just put them on the record. Um, the, in 2011, the Auditor General uh, suggested uh, where there's differences among schemes and contribution and level of benefits, uh, there should be a clear statement of aims and objectives. I find that helpful. The second question um, I asked about the, is the scheme affordable? In 2011, there was a 240 million deficit and the Cabinet Secretary said, responded, uh, a review, uh, and I quote obviously, a review and evaluation is due later this year. So I would obviously welcome that looking forward. Uh, the next point is, uh, and I just quote the Cabinet Secretary, um, I am once, well, uh, what, only once we had an actuarial valuation of the scheme over the long term would they be able to answer my question about whether we are continuing with a 240 million deficit, which is obviously considerable given that it has to be taken from other budgets and really how far the increased contributions go towards 
uh, addressing that deficit. And the, uh, yes, the final point is really an update. Given that I was talking about figures in 2011, um, it would be helpful if we could get that. Okay, thank you. Any other members wish to comment at this stage? I do note that there are, um, there's a policy note at the back of the, uh, which, which does refer to the financial effects of the uh, instrument, um, saying it's in line with the reform of public sector pensions, etc. However, I do take, do take on the points that uh, Mary's made. Um, this is obviously a negative instrument, but I think, uh, in general terms, would the committee be quite happy for me to write to the Cabinet Secretary raising the questions that uh, uh, Mary has raised today? Content with that. Well, I'll do that, Mary, if that's suitable. Okay, we'll do that. Any other points? No? Okay. Given the Scottish Government intends to correct the instrument, does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on the instrument? Okay. That's agreed. Uh, thank you very much. That concludes our business for today, and I close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>